Hi, I'm Chantel and this is a Doc on the Go. On a recent trip to Uganda, I visited the Buganda Palace. What I learned was quite intriguing, so I decided to whip out a camera and bring you this Doc on the Go. But before we dive in, let's get a quick overview. So, Uganda, officially the Republic of Uganda, sits in East Africa, bordered by Kenya to the east, the Democratic Republic of Congo to the west, Rwanda to the southwest, Tanzania to the south, and South Sudan to the north. In Uganda, the Buganda Kingdom encompasses a large part of the south of the country, including its capital Kampala. The people in this region are Bantu and are referred to as Buganda, while the language they speak is Luganda. Got it? Country, Uganda. Kingdom, Buganda. People, Buganda. Language, Luganda. Now that we got the basics, let's learn a bit more about the Kingdom of Buganda from my amazing tour guide, Alan. Buganda Kingdom has uh, existed for over 800 years. And uh, so far we've had 36 uh, kings. The current king, whose name is Ronald Mwenda Mutebi II, is number 36. Uh, though he's uh, a king without uh, political power, he's ceremonial, he doesn't have to participate in any political activities. And uh, the constitution of Uganda does not allow him to say anything connected with the politics of the country. Now, Buganda Kingdom is uh, located in the central part of Uganda. And uh, the two names, Uganda and Buganda, sound the same. Uh, Buganda is believed to have been the mother of Uganda because as the, as the British were creating the country Uganda, they were uh, positioned here in Buganda Kingdom. This is where they started from. And then they united all those tribes together with the Buganda Kingdom. So they had a belief that it was Buganda Kingdom that gave birth to this new country that they created. So they named her after the mother, Buganda. And to make a difference between the two, they had to remove the B from Buganda and created a shorter name, Uganda. Now, uh, here we have uh, a royal mile, and it is the road that stretches from the palace up to the Buganda administration block. So the plan of having a royal mile here was copied from Scotland in the 1950s. And uh, that was when our former king was called Mutesa II visited there. He saw the Edinburgh Royal Mile, which was so interesting to him. Then when he came back here, he decided to have the Royal Mile, uh, the, 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 the administration block constructed at the other end of the road so that can have a Royal Mile of his own. Now the Royal Mile here has uh, 56 trees on both sides. And these trees represent the 56 clans of the Buganda tribe. Now the clans are family lineages to which we all belong. So for whoever is a Muganda by tribe must be from one of these 56 clans. And these are family lineages that can be traced like 800 years back. And everyone here knows a clan they belong to. We can also differentiate different people from different clans by names because each clan has got their own names. So it is very hard to find a name from one clan and then you find it in the other clan. So you can easily know that someone is from a certain clan just by knowing their names. And still, when it comes to the clan system, we do not marry from the same clan, but we must marry across clan. People of the same clan are one family, so they are relatives. So I may move from here and probably go to a certain country. If I meet a lady who comes from the same clan as the Yam, that is my sister. I can't relate with her. She's my sister. So I still do not marry from my mother's clan because all the girls from my mother's clan are her sisters. That makes them my aunties. Now, on the Royal Mile still, we have sculptures and uh, some of these are animals, others are birds, we have some insects, we have plants and other things. So these are the totems for the clans of Buganda. And the totems are like uh, symbols of identification. So if you ask which clan I come from, I'll tell you I'm from the elephant clan. 
So the elephant is my totem and it is the symbol that identifies me as someone who belongs to that family. Now, when it comes to the totems, we do not eat our totems. Uh, for example, I come from the elephant clan, so I cannot eat elephant meat. I'm, I'm very lucky that in Buganda Kingdom there is no one who eats elephant meat. So I'm not missing out on anything. But we have people that have totems that are edible in our daily lives. For example, we have people from the mushroom clan. So those people cannot eat mushrooms, but for the rest of us can eat. Now, the Mango Palace is uh, the, still the official palace of uh, the Buganda Kingdom, though uh, our king does not live here. So he comes around for celebrations and sometimes he comes for meetings. And uh, whenever he comes around, he spends something like three to four hours. Then he goes back to his other palace, which is at a place called Chireka. As you take uh, the, uh, the direction uh, towards the east, uh, that is uh, along the way to Jinja. So it's about 11 kilometers from the Mango Palace. Now, uh, here he just never spends any nights. Now, uh, we shall re later realize that uh, there are lots of people who are killed on this hill. And those were the days when we had dictators like Idi Amin and then Obote. So during those days, uh, the Mango Palace had been turned into a military base. So the soldiers who lived on this hill uh, killed many people on these grounds. And in our traditions, such a place would be unclean to the king. So it's one of the reasons that's why he doesn't live here. And he just comes around for a few hours. Then he goes back to his other palace. Now, this palace was established in 1885. And that's, that was uh, by King Mwanga. So Mwanga was the 31st king of Buganda. Now, before he came to this hill, uh, this hill was occupied by people from one of the clans. That is the Hippopotamus clan. And uh, you know, each clan here has got a different role that they play for the king, either within the palace grounds or outside the palace grounds. Now, the first occupants of this place uh, the people from the Hippopotamus clan uh, were the king's herbalists and uh, they had grinding stones which they could use to grind uh, the herbs and in our language the grinding stones are the ones that we call mango so it was from these grinding stones that uh, this hill gained the name that's why it is called mango hill then when the king came around it became the mango palace and this mango is spelled as m-e-n-g-o not M-A. It might sound like the fruit, but it is not in any way connected with the mango, the fruit. These are grinding stones. Now, King Mwanga lived on the mango hill up to 1897, and that was when he was arrested by the British after having tried to fight against them. You see, in 1897, he had signed an agreement with them accepting Buganda Kingdom to become a British protectorate. And uh, he didn't realize that at some point they'll have to reduce his power as king. When they did so, he was so disappointed. Then he began fighting against them. But uh, he didn't have enough weapons, so he lost that battle. He was arrested and taken to the Seashells Islands, where he later died in 1903. Then he was succeeded by his son, who was called Daudi Chua. So Daudi Chua was the second king of Buganda to live on this hill. For he lived here up to 1939, and that was when he also passed away. Then he was succeeded by his son, who was called Mutesa II. And Mutesa II was the last king of Buganda to live on the Mango Hill. Uh, he lived here up to 1966, and that, that was when this palace was attacked by the soldiers of Obote. Now, Apollo Milton Obote was one of the former presidents of uh, Uganda. He at first became president in 1966. Then before him, Mutesa II, the king of Buganda, had been made the first ceremonial president of Uganda after independence, 1962. Then during those days, Obote was the prime minister and he was uh, the one with the executive powers. So at some point, the two people fell apart because Obote as prime minister had already begun acting as a dictator. And at the same time, he was very corrupt. So the king, as president, 
criticized Obote and Obote didn't like that. So Obote decided to get rid of the king by organizing an attack using Idi Amin as the army commander either to kill the king here or just to have him arrested. So the king managed to escape. He went to exile in England. It's 1969 and in a flat in the poor South London neighborhood of Bermondsey, Sir Edward Mutesa, the Kabaka, the ruler of the Kingdom of Buganda and the first president of independent Uganda, talks of his life in exile. Well, it's very difficult indeed. I am, of course, on um, public assistance, national assistance, and uh, that is complicated enough, although I have uh, friends who do help me a great deal. And uh, without those friends, I don't think uh, really been able to uh, keep my head above water. But again, he was uh, poisoned and died there in 1969. And our people believe that it was plotted by Obote. And it's over 40 years since the first president of Uganda died in exile in London. Sir Edward Mutesa, who was the traditional ruler of the ancient kingdom of Buganda, had been forced to flee the country after being ousted by Milton Obote. His friends still question the circumstances of his death. Then, when Obote took over the presidency, he passed a constitution that abolished the kingdoms in Uganda and then turned this place into a military base. The soldiers occupied this hill from 1966 up to 1997. And uh, that was when uh, the current uh, president decided to give the hill back to the kingdom. Then the soldiers were taken away to other places. After the attack on the palace, some of the possessions of King Mutasa II, which remained on the property, were his cars. So here we have the remains of the former king's cars. Uh, that was Mutesa II. He had a number of luxurious cars. And among these he had Daimlers, he had uh, Cadillacs, he had Rolls Royces, he had Chevrolets and other types. So some of these cars were destroyed when this place was attacked by the soldiers of Obote in 1966. And, uh, here we have this big one, which was uh, Daimler Limo, model 1962. It was one of those that survived being destroyed because by the time this place was attacked, it was not on the grounds. Then it was further destroyed by time and weather because it was abandoned after the owner having been hosted. Then under the Daimler, there's a second car. You can see that uh, frame, uh, the chassis, uh, that was the Cadillac, which was completely destroyed. Then we have a Rolls Royce behind there. It still has the symbol of the RR. So the Rolls Royce was also completely destroyed. So, after Milton Obote ousted King Mutasa II, he was soon ousted by his former ally, Idi Amin. And there began a murderous period at the palace and a very dark period in Uganda's history. Here was uh, one of uh, Idi Amini's torture chambers. Um, at first it was uh, an armory which was constructed from 1971 to 72. And uh, that's a period when Idi Amin had just become president. So the construction itself was uh, done by the Israelis because uh, they used to do a lot of construction with uh, the Uganda government. So it was Idi Amin who called them here to have this constructed as an armory. He then used it to store his weapons for only eight months. And after those months, he got information that uh, Obote, the one he had overthrown, was in Tanzania, trying to get some military assistance to fight back. So Idi Amin had to take away all the weapons which were being kept here so that he can prepare for war against Obote. Then uh, during the preparations, he began arresting all those people who were suspected to be supporters of Obote and still for whoever seemed to be a political threat. The lots of these people could be brought into this place and was turned into a torture chamber. Idi Amin was president of Uganda for eight years, that is from 1971 to 1979. And uh, during that period, he killed uh, an estimated number of 500,000 people in the whole of Uganda. So uh, to some people, he's considered to have been the, uh, 
the, the, the Hitler of Africa because he was the worst uh, dictator that Africa has ever had. When we arrived at State House in Tebi, General Amin announced himself as the Black Hitler, the name given to him by the liberal leader Jeremy Thorpe. He said he was happy with the title because it meant he was a strong, tough man. And uh, it's because he killed lots of people in Uganda, and not only in Uganda, but also in the neighboring countries. Uh, for example, he, uh, there, there are many people, uh, the Tanzanian people, who are killed because Idi Amin wanted to extend Uganda's borderlines into Tanzania. So he had this idea of having the whole of Lake Victoria inside Uganda. So he tried to capture all that land that surrounded Lake Victoria though he couldn't uh, manage. Now, um, this uh, place, as I've told you, that uh, it was used as an armory for only eight months. And uh, after those months, he got information that Obote, the one he had overthrown, was in Tanzania, trying to get military assistance to fight back. So he took away all the weapons uh, so that he can prepare for war against Obote. Then during the preparations, he began arresting all those people who were suspected to be supporters of Obote and still for whoever seemed to be a political threat. The loss of these people could be brought into this place and was turned into a torture chamber. Now, uh, whenever the soldiers uh, uh, brought prisoners, uh, they could first switch off the electricity. So the entrance to this uh, torture chamber, uh, there was uh, a strong metallic gate which could be electrified. And then, uh, inside there is a, a green stripe which shows the level of water so whenever it rained uh, the place could be flooded by water and uh, the water could also be electrified so whenever they saw the soldiers brought prisoners in they could first switch off the electricity then force them to walk through the water and they could first uh, torture them using this the electricity in the water so they could keep switching on and off on and off for about 30 to 40 minutes and they could do that kind of torture, trying to extract information from these prisoners. And then after that kind of torture, they could finally switch off and then force them to climb into the five rooms which worked as the prison cells. So the rooms also had sliding doors, though all these doors were broken away by the last group of soldiers on uh, the Mango Hill. Now, uh, inside the rooms, the soldiers could pack so many prisoners, they could have between 80 and 120 prisoners in just one room. And because of the limited space, and uh, you can also see that uh, the thing is underground, uh, there are no ventilators or windows in the rooms, so the aeration was also very limited. So these people could run out of oxygen and many could suffocate to death. And then after some few days, others could die of uh, starvation because here they could not feed them with anything. Then the bodies from here could be carried on the trucks and dropped on the roadsides, a few of them into the Kingis Lake, which is down in the valley there, and then many others into Lake Victoria, and uh, they could be eaten up by uh, crocodiles and some other animals and birds. Then Idi Amin used this as a torture chamber for six years. That was from 1973 to 79 when he was overthrown. And uh, he killed an estimated number of 7,500 people in just uh, this. Then on the walls there are lots of uh, writings, but uh, they are written by visitors who come here, most of which are students who just feel like they should leave a mark. And then there are some few people who believe that their relatives and friends must have been killed from uh, this uh, place. And then on the walls there are also some uh, bullet holes. Uh, so they are proof that uh, there are some people who must have been shot to death in these uh, torture chambers. Standing in the torture chambers made me quite emotional as I thought of all the atrocities which took place in that space. But as horrific and cruel as most think Idi Amin's rule to be, he still had his allies. This here was uh, one of Idi Amini's cannons and uh, it was a German-made machine and a Second World War technology. So he got a number of such cannons from Gaddafi, the former president of Libya, because uh, Gaddafi was a good friend of Idi Amin and uh, he tried to support him with weapons during the fight against the Tanzanian soldiers who had started attacking Uganda in 1978 with an intention of overthrowing Idi Amin 
which they later did in 1979. So Gaddafi had to help his friend with a number of such weapons. And since this was a military base during those days, uh, this was one of those that were brought here. Then, as the soldiers were leaving this place in 1997, they realized that this was no longer working, so they just left it behind. And for us, it was displayed here to commemorate the 18 years of dictatorship that we went through. And uh, this started with uh, the first five years of Obote, 1966 to 1971. Then Idi Amin took over up to 1979. Uh, those are eight years. And still Obote came back for a second regime in 1980 up to 1985. So in total, that's 18 years of just having bad leadership in Uganda. And whenever you look at this canon, we are reminded of uh, that period. The people of Uganda certainly walked through difficult times, but they are strong, they are resilient, they are creative. And on the palace grounds, I also saw much evidence of their creativity and ingenuity. Our ancestors uh, used vegetal materials in construction. They could use grass, they could use reeds and other things, wood. So. Uh, here we have this uh, fence which is made out of reeds. So they used these reeds to fence off their homes and palaces. So this was put back here to bring back the picture of an old palace. So previously we had one but it was falling apart and now it was replaced in a stronger way. So whenever we see this we, rem we remember how an old palace looked like. Uh, outside here we have uh, a brick wall, but uh, before it was constructed in 1955, uh, the, 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 all the fence for this palace was made out of reeds. So the same thing applies to this inner palace. Majestic reed fences weren't the only creative things we saw at the palace. Alan also took me through the process of making bark cloth. Okay, so this here is uh, an African fig tree and uh, its uh, scientific name is Ficus natalensis. Now this is one of the most important trees in our traditions uh, because our ancestors used to get cloth from this. Now we have this uh, brown colored material which is uh, the bark cloth and it is the kind of cloth that was invented by our ancestors about 500 years back. So they used it as uh, their cloth before they got the silk and cotton. Now this, the skin of this, the tree is uh, peeled from the trunk and it is banged using wooden mallets and uh, it, uh, it stretches like four times more than its original size. Wherever they produce back cloth from, there is always a wooden beam like this. And it is on the wooden beam that the fresh skin of the African fig tree is placed. Uh, we have this uh, simple skin which is already dry so it cannot use, be used to produce back cloth. The one that can produce back is supposed to be fresh with its fluids but we just use this for demonstrations. So it is placed on the wooden beam and then use wooden mallets to bang it. And the more it is banged it keeps on losing the fluids and it stretches. I've told you that uh, it stretches about four times more than its original size. And uh, by the end of eight hours of banging, someone can easily come up with uh, a piece which is about four meters long. And uh, you know, nowadays this uh, back cloth is used in the culture functions. It is also used as uh, a decorative. People use it to make craft works. And uh, uh, people like us use it to make uh, such uh, paintings which would work as good souvenirs for visitors that would come to Uganda. Uh, an example of the uh, piece of back cloth that uh, was produced as a demonstration, uh, we have this. But this is also a rough piece of work. Uh, there are people who produce much better quality, like uh, all the pieces that you see here, they are made on quality back cloth, which is produced by people who are more experienced in producing the back cloth. But for this one, it's not good quality because it was produced by people who are not uh, experienced in producing it. 
So for someone to be a good backcloth producer needs skill and experience. Now after peeling off the skin, the tree is not left naked to die. But the, 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 this part is uh, wrapped using fresh banana leaves so that it can get protection against the sun. And then after something like five days, it will have regained uh, a layer that uh, is resistant to the sun. Then the, the skin starts regenerating. And after about eight months, it will be fully grown and still can be harvested to produce more bark cloth. After I learned all about bark cloth and purchased a painting on bark cloth done by Alan himself, he also walked me through the game Omweso. Let me know if it looks familiar to you. This is uh, an African uh, chess. Uh, for us, we call it Omweso. And uh, you can find this in many African communities, though in different communities it is somehow played differently with different rules and also different structure. So for us, it has four lines and it is played by two people. So the, the, one of, the pass, one of the, uh, these uh, players uh, plays you, uh, within these uh, two lines and then the others also uses two lines. So the playing is done anti-clockwise. We pick the seeds. Uh, we can start from anywhere, so I can start from here and then I drop one by one going anti-clockwise. So once I drop my last seed in a pit which has a seed or one or more than one seed and my opponent also has seeds in both uh, pits in the same line, then I must take this from him and then I come back to the starting point. So now I have dropped my last seed, but he has nothing that I can take. That means that I have to continue and pick from here, then keep on playing. And once I drop my last seed in an empty pit, it will be his turn to play. And he does exactly the same as I have done. So it was played only by the men uh, because, uh, you know, these, the pits could be etched on the ground. So the men could squat as they played. And uh, in our traditional setting, a woman cannot squat. It would be indecent of her to squat. And still, when someone starts playing this game, they don't want to stop. So. For, for the women, they could uh, be preparing food for their families. So if at all they went in to play this game, they would spend much of their time uh, playing and then in the end they burn the food. So they were not supposed to play this, it was only meant for the men. Even now there are still lots of gentlemen out there who play this game. While I was at the palace, I also got a very special treat. A group came to bring gifts to the king. I got to see firsthand some of the pride and tradition that is still very alive and well in Uganda. My name is Mkasa James. I'm from Katikam Sub County, uh, Royal District. The county, according to the kingdom, is called Bulemezi. One of the counties in the Buganda Kingdom. I'm standing with the sub county chief, Madam Sise Serunjoji. She's the chief. I'm the speaker of the council, yeah. and my colleague is uh, Mustafa Degeya, a parish chief. According to our culture, we call him a Muluka chief. Muluka is uh, the parish. So we, it is a routine that we, the subjects have to look after their king. So normally we collect gifts and bring them to the king. When he accepts them, we call them Makula. So he takes them to help him feed his subjects in the palaces. It is normally done by the subjects uh, from the grassroots. That's why we are here. And he has been so happy through his uh, representative to receive 
the gifts that we have brought this morning. Signing out from the Buganda Palace in Kampala, Uganda. I am Chantel Evelyn and this has been A Doc on the Go.